Hi class, so today we're going to start a new topic. We're going to be talking about imperialism for the next couple days before we start to learn about our final unit, which is the Industrial Revolution. Um, so let's get started. So as everything's going on over in France, which we've just finished our unit on the French Revolution, across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, you have the people of the French colony of uh, Saint-Dominique, which is called Haiti now, on the island of Hispaniola. It's in the Caribbean near Cuba. And the people there were watching the French Revolution pretty closely. So this colony was the richest plantation colony in the world with about 8,000 plantations. And this colony produced about 40% of the world's sugar and about half of its coffee. So it made these profits through slave labor. There were around 500,000 enslaved people living in Haiti uh, or Saint-Dominique, along with around 30,000 free people of color and 40,000 whites. Uh, the white population themselves were divided between wealthy plantation owners, known as Grand Blanc, and poor whites, who were known as Petit Blanc. And the social structure of this colony was very unstable, as whites free people of color and the enslaved population who made up over 90% of the colony, they each had their own grievances and problems and they were all upset for different reasons. So this rich colony was structured around exploitation, around slavery and enormous inequalities. And in 1791, it revolted in the most radical of all the revolutions of this era. So this revo revolution was called the Haitian Revolution from 1791 to 1808. And it was more than, more than any other a social revolution for human rights and equality, regardless of skin color. Uh, it began with a revolt of slaves in 1791 after the National Assembly of France abolished slavery. So the Haitian Revolution really established the second independent republic in the Americas and the first independent nation state um, that was ruled by people of African descent, right? So the other republic in this region that gained independence, the first one was the United States, so uh, which we learned about in our in unit on the Enlightenment. So Haiti, the Haitian Revolution establishes the second independent republic in the Americas after the United States. And a man named Toussaint Louverture, Toussaint, um, he emerged as the leader of the revolution. He managed to overcome international resist or internal resistance in the colony, right? And he outmaneuvered foreign powers like the Spanish Brit Empire and the British Empire. He was a brilliant general, and he defeated Napoleon's attempt to try to regain French control over the colony. So the nation of Haiti formally declared its independence on January 1st, 1804. And this newly independent nation rejected European racist hierarchies, and they defined all Haitians as black. And uh, the plantation system in Haiti was dismantled, and Haiti became a nation of subsistence farmers who worked their own land, right? And this is a map of the colony of Saint-Dominique on the western half of the island of uh, Hispaniola that would become the nation of Haiti. So this is a map you see here. And this is an image of Haitian revolutionaries fighting for independence in 1802, right? Now let's talk a little bit about some Latin American revolutions. So can you imagine a United States of Latin America? Well, in the early 19th century, some Latin American revolutionaries wanted to do exactly that. But a unified Latin America remained really a dream. In North America, colonists had fought off the British, as you know. In France, the lower classes overthrew the old regime. In Haiti, the enslaved, the slaves fought off the French and overthrew the wealthy plantation owners to create their own republic. And in Latin America, well, that wasn't so clear at the start. Um, the Creole population led the revolutions initially. The Creole are people of Spanish or Portuguese descent who were born in the Americas. And they revolted in response to the events happening in Europe during this time. So in 1808, 
During this time, Napoleon invaded and conquered Spain and Portugal, who were the two colonial powers that controlled Latin America. And suddenly, because of his invasion, these Latin American colonies found themselves without a direct European power telling them what to do. So in 1810, peasants in Mexico revolted because they wanted their own land and because food prices were way too high. Um, two priests named uh, Miguel Hidalgo and Jose Morelos led the insurrection, the rebellion, but it was eventually put down by wealthy Creole landowners with the support of the Catholic Church. Uh, both the Creoles and the church were alarmed. They were out like upset by the social radicalism of the revolt, and they were worried that it would end like the French and Haitian revolutions. So a less radical declaration of independence followed in 1821 through an alliance of rich Creole elites and more conservative clergy. Um, fear of rebellions, as violent as the Haitian and French revolutions were, but that fear loomed over the Latin American revolutions from 1810 to 1825. Um, divisions along racial, class, and ideological lines uh, led to violence. And in the northern regions of Latin America, the revolutionary general Simon Bolivar, who I talked about in our Enlightenment unit, he successfully fought Spanish forces and created a short-lived Gran Colombia uh, between 1819 and 1830. And this was modeled directly after the United States. Um, Bolivar had the support of the relatively new nation of Haiti, and he actually visited Haiti twice. Um, and Haiti even sent soldiers and weapons to help Bolivar fight the Spanish. Um, another revolutionary, uh, another liberal revolutionary was Jose de, Sa de uh, San Martin. And he led a revolt against the, the Spanish as well, but he did that in Southern Latin America. And, uh, you know, these revolutions that I just talked about, they did not necessarily lead to long lasting constitutional republics. They were actually soon replaced by rulers who cared more about their own, getting their own power than they did about the liberal ideas of the enlightenment that, you know, allowed them to rule in the first place. Um, so some of these rulers, these new rulers that would replace Simon Bolivar and Jose de San Martin, they ruled on the basis of uh, populist politics, family networks, and you know military strength. Uh, and here is an image. This is uh, Jose Sa Jose de San Martin being received by the Congress of Buenos Aires in 1818. So he's one of those liberal revolutionaries. So even though each of these revolutions uh, that we've learned about. We learned about the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and now you've kind of learned a little bit about, a bit about some Latin American revolutions and the Haitian Revolution. Uh, even though they all had their own origins, their own causes, important figures and results, they were all tied together by three things. First, Enlightenment ideas and ideals inspired all of them. Second, each revolution rejected rule without representation. And finally, they were connected by economic and political networks. Um, it's not as if all revolutions challenged every issue. The Haitian Revolution was definitely the most radical. The others resulted in political change rather than social or economic change. But nevertheless, this was an era in history that led to the creation of new nations and the beginning of the end for the old regime in Europe and European colonialism in the Americas. So now let's talk a little bit about what happens after. We have these new nations, right? And um, we still have those European empires that are out there. They haven't suddenly just disappeared. But uh, things are going to change as we move into the 1800s. So the world in 1880 was made up of both nation states um, like the United States, Haiti, right? And empires, the British Empire. Um, we have the German Empire, the French Empire. And as you've learned, you know, once that idea of sovereignty seems achievable, it goes viral, right? So once they saw the American Revolution, once they saw the French Revolution, other countries like countries in Latin America, like I said, in Haiti, 
they realize like, oh, this is possible. We can do this. And this idea spreads around the world. So people around the world were increasingly driven by a nationalistic feeling to have their own countries, their own nation states. And this meant that some empires were slowly breaking up. At the same time, though, many great imperial powers still held on to colonies, as in South Asia and in the Caribbean. Um, nearly all the industrialized states had hit the pause button on empire expansion by this time. And they're happy to kind of stick with what they already had. But in 1880, that changed faster than you could say uh, production and distribution, distribution. Like that happened really quickly, right? Um, and suddenly vast regions of the world were colonized by empires that were once again growing. These empires were once again growing. So for instance, in 1880, the enormous continent of Africa was still mostly made up of independent states and societies. By 1914, after the scramble for Africa, that's what we call it, when Europe invaded, European powers invaded and divided up uh, Africa. By 1914, just about 40 years later, Ethiopia and Liberia were the only two independent states in Africa that were left. The rest of the continent was colonized and divided between Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, Italy, Belgium, and Spain. So another area, meanwhile, mainland Southeast Asia was conquered, mostly by France. Many Pacific islands were occupied by the United States, Japan, Germany, France, and Britain. Korea was subjugated, conquered by Japan. And this rapid expansion of colonization around 1880 is often called new imperialism. So what happened in the last decades of the 19th century that caused this rapid change? Um, so here's a map. This is kind of, it's kind of blurry, but it's a special map. It doesn't show different empires. Instead, it shows the growth of empires overall in the late 19th and early 20th centuries which is what we call new imperialism. And again, what happened to cause this? And when it, was it actually new? What's so new about new imperialism? So uh, what was new about it? Now, to begin to answer that question, we have to define some rather messy terms. The first is imperialism, and the second is colonialism. These two terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but they're actually different. Both occur in empire, which is a third term we're going to have to define. Uh, so empires are states made up of many communities where one community has control over and more rights than the others. Imperialism is a term used to describe the ideas, beliefs, and actions that one group uses to justify and hold control over the others. Colonialism is the experience of the other groups who are being ruled. But again, these last two terms, colonialism and imperialism, are in practice sometimes used interchangeably. Now, empires go back thousands of years in world history. Uh, they divided people into a community of citizens with rights and communities of subjects with few or none. They also divided their territory into multiple states and regions. Um, these empires had one ruler or ruling body controlling these different people and regions. Um, they did it then and they did it again in the late 19th century. So we're still not seeing the new part here. In fact, when we look closer at the empires of the new imperialism, we see that they were partly modeled on earlier empires. For example, Britain ran their new colonies in Africa in much the same way as they'd been running their massive colony in India for a century. Um, even more surprisingly, Britain's policies and procedures for managing India, which was a region far larger than Britain itself, right? It's humongous. And uh, their policies for managing it were partly based on strategies that the Mughal Empire had used to control India over a hundred years earlier. So, for example, the British model of indirect rule in their new African colonies, which was to find local allies and pay them to do most of the governing, was based on similar practices they had learned from the Mughals in Southeast Asia or in South Asia. Um, 
some British methods of ruling the new colonies were influenced by even older policies that they had created to rule their North American and Caribbean colonies in the 16th and 17th centuries. So you can see same old methods, same old strategies. Nevertheless, many factors led to this unpre unprecedented new version of empire expansion after the 1880s. And there were technologies, ideas, and beliefs, these new technologies, ideas, and beliefs that gave Europeans and the inhabitants of a few other countries a motive and a reason, a cause, and justification for constructing their empire. So many of these were new, and certainly their combination was new. And so that's why we call this a new imperialism. So here is an image from the 1884 Berlin Conference. And this was when European powers basically came together uh, and they set the rules for colonizing Africa. Uh, and dividing it up amongst themselves. And notice that no Africans were present at this conference. You don't see any of them here at this meeting, right? That, that's obvious. This was all Europeans coming together to do that. So why did it happen? So in 1865, a British parliamentary committee, right? A, a British, the British parliament had a committee that recommended that Britain pull back from some of its colonies instead of expanding. That was 1865. By the 1880s, this stance had been completely reversed. Britain was rapidly trying to build a bigger empire alongside other industrial powers like Germany and France. So why were they and many other nations, like the ones I just mentioned, so eager for getting more colonies? And in order to understand new imperialism, we need to look at many factors, not just one. Um, and so they each kind of play off each other in important ways. The changing elements that allowed for new imperialism include technology, industrialization and capitalism, racism, nationalism, and what I call men on the spot. So I'll begin with technology. So before the late 19th century, so before the late 1800s, European countries and Japan couldn't conquer much of the tropical world, right? When I say the tropical world, I mean, you know, literally the countries in the tropics, right? You know, with the, the rainforest and stuff. Those countries, Europe and Japan, they were held back by disease. But there were also uh, large organized societies in many of these regions in the tropics. And they were pretty well armed with low tech but effective weapons. So even if invaders had been able to take vast areas, slow communication systems would have made ruling these areas very difficult. And all of these problems were addressed and changed when several new technologies appeared. New medicines made it possible for Europeans and white Americans to survive malaria and other tropical diseases. So they were able to go to those countries and invade them. The machine gun and other new tech to new weapons gave conquerors a big military advantage. Um, telegraphs, trains, and steamships reinvented communications, made communication easier and better and more efficient, and travel better uh, as well, which made it easier to rule these bigger empires. So that's one reason why new imperialism happened. The next one, in industrialization and in capitalism. So this high tech wave uh, came about mostly out of industrialization. And this gave Europe, the United States and Japan these big advantages. Um, and it created some problems. The growth of factories in industrialized countries meant that their businesses had a increasing demand for raw materials and resources. So Korea, the African continent and Southeast Asia had almost no factories, but they had plenty of raw materials, right? Resources. So since imperialists were also capitalists for the most part, they needed customers. They needed people to buy their stuff for all this great new stuff they were making. They went for a kind of two for one deal by conquering these territories that could both provide them the raw materials that they needed to make these things and 
by conquering these territories, they could have a population who would then have to buy their finished products. So that was another reason why these countries went out and um, conquered and took territories. The next one is racism. So existing misconceptions about race, uh, many of them which emerged with the Atlantic slave trade that you've learned about in previous history classes, they were becoming more solidified in this era. Many people within these big imperial powers believed it was their right to rule over people that they thought were inferior. Uh, within their own societies, there was already some level of racial segregation. So, for example, in the United States at this time, post-slavery Jim Crow laws tried to reduce the freedoms and rights of African Americans. And when applying these superior, inferior racist ideas to ruling people overseas, some even justified their invasions as if they were doing them a favor. So they viewed empire expansion as a civilizing mission to try to supposedly improve the lives of the quote unquote uncivilized and inferior people that they conquered. So they believed they were going to be able to civilize them. That's another reason why new imperialism happened. Now, nationalism. You may remember that nationalism began with the idea that all people should, you know, have the right to rule themselves through their own government, right? And, you know, it's extreme devotion and loyalty to one's nation, right? But nationalism could be twisted to the idea that one's own nation was superior to other nations, and therefore they had a right to rule over them, right? So it could also create, um, nationalism also created a competitive attitude among nations. So in this era of imperialism, new imperialism, nationalism pushed the governments of Britain, France, Germany, and other European powers to compete with one another, first in Europe, right? Um, and then around the world. So nationalism motivated imperialists to take new colonies before their competitors could get there and take them themselves. So men on the spot, this term was created when writers paid less attention to women in history. But in hindsight, it may not uh, be an achievement that you'd really want on your resume anyway. Um, everything we have mentioned so far was the result of big trends in the organization of societies. But sometimes power shifted because of one person or a few people. So in some cases, new colonies were carved out because a general, for example, or a businessman who had employees with guns, they just went out and grabbed some new territory, often because they were greedy or wanted glory. And there was no one there to stop them. And this happened way more often than you might think. So each of these factors played a role in the new imperialism the big global trend that had industrial powers rushing to claim new colonies depended on the interaction of these factors each time a new colony was created. So for example, a, a typical man on the spot likely used new weapons, technology, right, to conquer people he thought were inferior, uh, which is racism, right, to expand his business, which is motivated by what? Industrialism and capitalism and be politically rewarded back home for making his country proud, which is what? Nationalism, right? So uh, the situation in those colonies was also influenced by local factors. So we will talk a little bit about that. You know, how were locals organized to resist this? How did they react to this? Um, and, you know, what did they choose to do in response to this? And we'll talk about that um, next after I do this. So we're going to talk a little bit about the tools of imperialism. So imperialism, again, it's an idea. It's this belief that a society has a right and maybe a duty to conquer or dominate other places and rule or subjugate other people. But the word is often used, it's also often used to describe things that actually happen because of these ideas. So for example, adventurers and armies travel abroad and try to get other people to do what they want. Sometimes they do this without actually conquering and claiming control of these other communities. And we call this informal imperialism because there's not a formal claim to sovereignty or the establishment of a colony. 
uh, sometimes territories and people are actually conquered and a colony is established, creating another set of practices that we usually call colonialism. Um, in all of these cases, right, no matter what, people's lives are changed and sometimes taken, right, killed. So imperialism starts as an idea, but it has substantial consequences. So how does all of this happen? What are the physical tools, instruments, technologies that help turn imperialism, the idea, into the imperialist practice of colonialism? So we're going to look at a few of them right now. So the first is ways of thinking about the world. Of course, the first tool of imperialism is just the way that pro-empire thinkers saw the world. Uh, you know by now that, you know, I've, as I've said in this lesson in, the, in this 19th century, empire promoted a variety of ideas. There was the belief that the people of the world could be divided by race and that some races were better than others. There was another similar belief that some people were civilized while others were barbarians or savages who could be supposedly upgraded to civilized if they were taught to act differently. So this encouraged the attitude that the imperial society should kind of act like a father, teaching and disciplining the supposed children of the colonies, right? Um, this here on the right is the Navy Leagues of Britain. And this was an organization that lobbied and advocated for a larger navy and empire for Britain. And they actually even recruited children into this effort, right? So these ideas that I'm talking about, they helped to justify the creation of empires in the age of industrialism. They also brought people together in organizations like this one you see on the right, the Navy League of Britain. Um, there were other ones like the American National Geographic Society or the British Navy League or Japan's Imperial Rule As uh, Assistance Association. And these organizations actually published books and messages to convince the public that empire was a good idea. And they even lobbied their government, tried to convince their government to expand the empire. Um, so let's talk more about the tools. So many tools of imperialism were ab abstract ideas, but there were also actual physical tools. Industrial age weapons, for example, allowed imperialists to coerce and to conquer people who had low tech weapons like swords, right? Or uh, spears. Railroads and steamships allowed imperialists to move their armies, supplies, and administrators to control large and distant territories more effectively. Um, new medicines allowed imperialists to survive diseases that had previously kept them out of tropical areas. Um, te telegraph and radio technology allowed imperial governments to communicate with their ships, governors, and agents. Um, imperialists used these and other technologies to claim that they were superior to the people they wanted to rule. And industrial empires with you know, these high-tech weapons or large militaries could often bully other states into doing what they wanted without really ever having to invade or directly control them. So this informal control is how Latin America, the Ottoman Empire, and China encountered imperialism. Britain, France, Japan, the United States, or another imperial power would, for example, they would demand something. Usually this was something economic, like better trade deals or access to local markets. If the, if the local government refused, the imperial power would send in a diplomat backed by a fleet or an army. And because imperial powers so often relied on powerful navies, it became known as gunboat diplomacy, right? And here on the right is a 1904 cartoon about U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, his quarterdeck diplomacy, his big stick diplomacy. So he said he wanted to speak softly and carry a big stick. And he sent a fleet, a Navy fleet, into the Caribbean to show off American naval power and used it to try to intimidate uh, other nations to do what he wanted. So that's an example of gunboat diplomacy. Um, knowledge was another tool of imperialism, and it was used in at least two different ways. First, as with technology, imperialists felt knowledge proved their superiority and justified their rule. So scholars from the empire, 
from the imperial power, they would visit a place that had nothing to do with them and claim that it was without knowledge, that the, the place they just came to didn't have any knowledge. They would dismiss oral traditions, local knowledge and skills that weren't industrial, and they would reject ways of writing that differed from their formal disciplines like history or anthropology. And they also dismissed local religions as inferior to their own. In a more practical way, imperial powers used knowledge that they gained from traveling the world. So imperial ships, for example, they didn't just carry soldiers and sailors. They also carried scientists. Science and empire were mutually reinforcing. They worked together. Empires funded scientists to travel around the world. And those scientists encountered new knowledge that often benefited the empire in some way. So the botanists, right, people who study like plants, nature, anthropologists, historians, and others who went to study foreign places, they were also in some ways acting as spies back then. They gathered knowledge about valuable resources, as well as about local politics and society and culture and conditions. And it allowed imperial armies and governments to march in and to know how to rule these places. Um, once a colony was actually conquered or acquired, a new set of tools came into use. Um, these were the tools of administration and bureaucracy. So uh, colonial powers, colon colonial administrations would create laws and systems of government that locals had to follow. Um, colonial subjects could not argue for what they needed or appeal a bad situation unless they followed these laws and used these courts. Uh, but the courts were often unfamiliar and really didn't use the local languages. So this gave the colonizers a great deal of power since they made, interpreted, and enforced the laws. So local people could sometimes create pressure to change the laws, but usually they, they didn't have a lot of success doing that. Um, money was another important tool of colonial rule. So colonialism brought conquered people under a new capitalist industrial system. So colonial subjects, suddenly they had to work for wages and pay taxes. Uh, many were perfectly happy to try to ignore the colonial government if possible, but they were still forced to pay taxes. So to pay taxes, they needed money. And to get money, they needed to work for the people who had it. And who had that money? Mostly companies that were run from the center of the imperial power. These companies wanted to make profits and pay as little as possible to workers. Um, some ran, for example, the big rubber plantations of Southeast Asia. Other companies bought the products that local people made. Um, in West Africa, the price of cocoa was set by a board that was dominated by the big chocolate companies like Nestle and Cadbury. And obviously they wanted to pay as little as possible to the cocoa growers to keep costs low and prof profits high. Um, the companies on the other hand, they paid very little in taxes, right? Whereas the colonial subjects, the people living there actually had a, they had a pay tax, unlike the companies. The colonial administration made its money by taxing local people, by taxing local populations, or putting import taxes on manufactured goods going to the colonies. Um, so goods would cost a lot for the local people, uh, for them to buy things at the market. Um, in particular, locals had to pay extra for goods imported from countries other than the imperial power. So for example, British colonies put big taxes on goods coming to India from Japan or France. They wanted all the sales to go to British companies only. At the same time, these taxes helped pay the soldiers and administrators who ran the colony. Um, let's talk a little bit about indirect rule. I kind of mentioned it earlier. So colonies were expensive to run. Uh, labor was cheap, but salaries for imperial administrators and soldiers were actually pretty high. Um, colonial administrators needed a tool for keeping down those costs. Um, rebellion was also really costly, right? So administrators needed to prevent unrest the best that they could. And the method that they came that they came to use is uh, called indirect rule. And this was a strategy learned partly from the British experience in India who in turn had learned from 
Mughal rule in South Asia before them. So ind indirect rule meant finding some locals, some local people and appointing them at much lower salaries than Europeans or Americans. Uh, these locals would act as clerks, soldiers, and minor officials under the supervision of citizens of the imperial power. So local labor was less expensive, and they also understood the local society better. Um, indirect rule, of course, had a weak spot. Local clerks, soldiers, and officials, they became experts on the imperial system. Uh, they knew how it worked. If they turned against colonial rule, the empire would then get into big trouble, right? And finally, schools. In the colonies, schools were set up mostly to train locals in basic skills so that they could serve as clerks, soldiers, and officials. They were to learn adding and subtraction, reading and writing, and the language of the colonizers. But schools did something else as well. They taught locals all of those ideas of imperialism. They taught them that they were inferior, that they were less civilized, and that all important knowledge came from the imperial power. This method was especially used in the colonies of European states. Again, there was an ironic problem here. Once people could read in the languages of Europe, they could read European thinkers, Enlightenment thinkers, who argued that everyone deserved liberty or equality. And so the local people then could use that to evaluate colonialism's legitimacy and question it, right? And here is an image. This is a French colonial school in Madagascar, right? It, does it really look like the students, like they're getting exciting, enriching, and affirming learning here? Um, probably not. They look very sad. Uh, so you see, everything comes back to ideas. Imperialism was a set of ideas that inspired actual practices and policies in the real world, mostly colonialism. And these were extremely unjust practices in many cases. Uh, but along with colonialism and these imperialist ideas, other ideas promoting freedom and individual sovereignty, right, through schools, as you see here, traveled around the world because of that. And those ideas would be very difficult for colonial governments to control, right? And so eventually you'll see that these countries around the world end up getting their independence because of this colonial system. By having schools, it leads to their own downfall. So let's talk a little bit about the resistance to colonial uh, imperial to colonialism and imperialism. What were some of the responses from local people to these to this industrial imperialism? So the struggle against imperialism, normally you would think of weapons and uprisings, violent revolts, as we've learned about in previous uh, lessons about other revolutions, right? But foods, you know, foods like corn and cassava, usually aren't in that picture when we think of this. But we're going to find out why you really should think of these things. The thing is that while armed struggles, violence, revolutions were forms of resistance to empire, they really weren't all that common in the modern period. Uh, new imperial powers had greater technologies and deadlier weapons, as we know, and colonized peoples, mostly peasants, couldn't fight them, at least not with weapons. There were subtle ways, though, to resist empire, and corn and cassava were two of them. So colonial states, they relied on income from fixed farming areas. That is, that they relied on the farm and its workers staying in one place. The imperial powers wanted to maximize farming output and export crops to make profits. And by using the forced labor of indig indigenous people, the people that lived the locals, that stayed in one place, that would keep production costs very low. Um, so here is on this right, it's an illustration a diagram for a cassava plant, also called a yucca in some places. So um, this system that the imperial powers relied on unravels when those local populations don't stay put. Um, after all those people, they were not getting any of the profits and only really needed enough food for themselves. So crops like corn and cassava, they grow in a way that allowed powers, uh, growers, I mean, to move around. And indigenous people sometimes migrated and changed their farming patterns to try to evade and to avoid uh, colonial oppression. So cassava, 
in particular made this easier because it required relatively very little labor for a pretty big return. Um, mobile groups, people moving around, mig uh, people migrating around could plant cassava and pretty much just walk away. And a couple years later, a community could come back and dig it up, uh, dig up these high calorie uh, tubers. It's kind of like a potato that you see here on the right. And they could eat the leaves also in the meantime. So cassava gave indigenous people a cheap, easy way to feed themselves while resisting colonial systems of forced labor. Uh, colonizers tried to brand cassava and corn as lazy crops for natives, right? They wanted to call them lazy, who wanted to avoid work. But these crops actually helped the, the natives, the indigenous people to resist empire, like activists. So was it aggressive and bloody? No. But was it effective and more common? Yes, yes it was. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, anti-imperialism and how peoples resisted in some of these colonies. So we're going to talk a little bit about Southeast Asia more specifically. So in the late 19th century, most of Southeast Asia came under either British, French, or Dutch control. This imperialism really disrupted existing lives and societies there, affecting both empires and their subjects. So it got very messy here. Uh, Colonizers controlled wealth, status, and survival, so people had to be careful and strategic about how they engaged with imperial power. But the people of the colonies, right, the people of the colonies, they're called colonial subjects, they had some ability to shape their own lives. More than individual survival, they also wanted to maintain their own di their dignity and their culture. Uh, so we're going to talk about how some communities in Southeast Asia responded to the new imperialism that began in the late 19th century. So on the right, you see this is a European colonization of Southeast, Southeast Asia. So you have uh, France is in control of French Indochina, which is in blue there. Uh, you have the Netherlands in control of the, dust, the Dutch East Indies, right? And so that is in orange. You have Portugal in control of Portuguese Timor, and the UK in control of British Burma, Malaya, and Borneo, and Spain is in control of the Spanish East Indies. Uh, so you can see European powers were all over Southeast Asia during this time. Um, French Indochina, in particular, was the colonial name for French-occupied areas in Southeast Asia. So in the late 19th century, the French actually invaded the places that are now called Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And European missionaries and merchants had already established some presence there. But in the late 19th century, you see the French invade. Um, so colonial maps can be kind of misleading, though. Uh, conquering a territory is not the same as truly controlling it. So although the local royal families technically accepted colonial rule, the French were met with constant mutinies and peasant uprisings and rebellions, which are easily recognizable as resistance. Others, and that was most people, just tried to survive and thrive within this difficult system. So for example, many Laotian villagers pretended to collaborate with the French while resisting at the same time. So the French believed that they were using local leaders to try to control villages, which was a key strategy in colonial empire building, remember, in direct rule. But the villages often put fake notables forward who had no real power. Uh, meanwhile, the real leaders secretly ran the villages according to Laotian interests rather than what the empire wanted. And the French had no clue that this was going on. So another example uh, from the city of Hanoi. It comes from the city of Hanoi in Vietnam, what we call Vietnam today. And this is where French construction projects like sewers brought in a large number of rats. And the French decided to pay the locals, the local people, to kill the rats and to give them a small amount of money per rat that they killed. So they, had, they just had to really bring the tail in as proof, the people, once they killed them. And people in Hanoi started clipping live rats' tails and releasing the rats back into the sewers to breed. And the rat population grew, and the high number of tails coming in basically broke the colony's treasury, right? So the French were paying out all this money and 
basically the locals were found a way to scam the French into doing this. And it left the French with an even worse rat problem as well. Uh, so that's just one example of resistance. But not everybody resisted French rule. Some minority groups, like the small Christian population, they saw French rule as a way to get ahead, especially by joining the military. Others, though, felt so oppressed by French colonial rule that instead of resisting, they just left, right? They followed a long pattern in the region of people fleeing the valleys and the deltas of uh, French Indochina, and they left and escaped to the hills and mountains, where, which were more difficult for the imperial government to get to. So as with Kassava, the Kassava example earlier, deep local knowledge of the environment was an advantage uh, that the locals had that the French didn't have. Um, even the French education policy kind of backfired. It tried to make Southeast Asians embrace French values and culture, and it worked to some extent, but it also gave many indigenous peoples the intellectual tools and ideas to resist French imperialism. So colonial subjects were able to form networks and groups and to share new ideas about revolution and resistance. And two great examples, um, there were two that formed the Vietnamese Nationalist Party in 1927 and who led the Vietnamese in battles against the French and eventually helped to win Vietnamese independence later on. Um, and they were all products of French education. They were, they were leaders who were taught in French schools. Um, so here on the right is a map of French Indochina, right? What it, what it looked like when the French had control over it before it became independent. So just like French Indochina, Dutch colonialism in Southeast Asia began with business, with industry, commercial activity in the form of the Dutch East India Company. Uh, but both the company and the Dutch government really struggled to control this region, just like the French had, had a hard time controlling French Indochina. So in Java, in, uh, in Indonesia, the Dutch tried to recruit Javanese aristocrats as leaders who would serve them, just like the French did in Indochina. And these aristocrats accepted Dutch political rule, but they got to keep some of their wealth and their ceremonies and court life. Other people, including those of lower social status, right? They could gain some political rights in various ways. Many learned to speak Dutch, converted to Christianity or adopted Dutch customs. So these are all examples of accommodation where people adapted to colonial rule and even benefited from it, but without entirely giving up their own culture or values. But some Javanese aristocrats didn't like this. Uh, one of them was uh, Raden Ma Saripati. Uh, I, this is a hard name to pronounce. Brodo Diningrat. Diningrat. So basically his name translates to esteemed golden lord who performs the most noble meditation in the world. That's a very long name. But this guy is remembered not really for his meditation skills, uh, but more for stealing a curtain from a Dutch colonizer. And you know, that might seem like a low level crime, but it was actually politically charged. The curtain that he stole was used in a symbolic way to maintain privacy and separation between the colonizer and the colonized. So by removing it, he signaled that the Dutch had not earned his respect and held no real authority over him. And so there was a court battle that took place after he stole this curtain and it basically brought a lot of pu publicity to his act of disobedience and this this act inspired aristocrats and others to basically question colonialism and its morality right and he kind of inspired them to do that um religious and spiritual beliefs also helped people to resist colonial rule so there was a large revival of islam in this period so for example um, Muslims were, you know, making their annual pilgrimage to Mecca called the Hajj in growing numbers, thanks to European transportation. Other local systems of belief revolved around mystics and holy people. And what all, what these all had in common is that they celebrated a higher authority than the, go the colonial government, right? Um, as in Indochina, 
Javanese peasants, they were able to get around colonial oppression to resist it by moving around or leaving. This was an important weapon that was used by otherwise powerless people. So peasants moved between Javanese and Dutch ruled areas. They understood that if they stayed in one place long enough to be counted, it might trap them into forced labor and high taxes. So they moved around a lot to try to resist. They also resisted colonial regulations by purposefully failing to comply. Like, for example, they would inaccurately report um, you know, the amount of land that they had or the crops that they had grown, right? Just to kind of make things even more difficult for the colonial powers, right? And um, as we saw in both Indochina and the Dutch East Indies, people moved around. They challenged authority. They failed to comply with colonial rulers uh, and rules. But the Southeast Asian highlands are perhaps the strongest example of resistance to colonial rule. In the second half of the 1800s, the British pushed into Burma, Malaya, and Borneo, but they and other colonial powers had a lot of trouble controlling the people living in the hilly regions of Southeast Asia. So these communities were incredibly mobile, right? They moved around a lot very easily, and they were widely dispersed across the highland region that was roughly the size of Europe itself. So like their Southeast Asian neighbors, many indigenous people here moved around to avoid taxation from the imperial power and to get away from forced labor. Uh, they resisted being included in colonial censuses. So those censuses are basically a survey counting how many people live in a certain area. So they resisted being included in those. They resisted uh, colonial writing and record keeping in general. And it was kind of a, you know, if you can't count me, you can't rule me strategy. And by some reports, peasants even vandalized or burned down offices of official records that colonial powers had set up. Um, unlike their Southeast Asian neighbors, these communities were more nomadic, right? So they would travel, migrate frequently, and they didn't stay in one place. And they were loosely organized. And colonizers found it hard to pin down local leaders or aristocrats who would work for them because of this. So over time, the British had to switch their tactics, their strategies. They tried to imitate the local custom of community gatherings around elaborate feasts where resources and political concerns were exchanged. So they tried to imitate that. And the British paid for a few of these big parties to happen in an effort to try to win favor and to establish more colonial ties. But the locals resisted by simply not showing up to the parties. Instead, they, they would hold their own smaller gatherings elsewhere. Um, and here is a map, the Southeast Asian Massif, which is in red, um, and that's like a geological area. So this is like the hilly region of Southeast Asia where a lot of these people were. So in the, all these cases that we've talked about in Southeast Asia, we've seen how col colonized people engaged with empire and resisted it. Um, even when these techniques weren't available, they found ways to voice their attitudes. Um, for example, the, the English writer George Orwell, when he described the occupation of Burma, which was in Southeast Asia, he said that the indigenous people communicated their disapproval anonymously or ambiguously, kind of vaguely. Uh, they would, for example, they would cause accidents by spitting at or tripping British colonizers, or they might actually laugh and insult them from far away enough to remain anonymous, right? Um, in addition, colonized people often created secret channels using special language codes, inside jokes, or satire to share their feelings of dissent and resistance. And people were incredibly creative in how they worked with or resisted imperial power. Um, just a, a side thing, you know, large rebellions, they're easily recorded in history, right? But these subtler forms of resistance that we've learned about which are, you know, they're kind of by design, much more off the record. Um, to learn about them, you know, we had to read sources differently and find new sources. And it's hard to find some of these written sources. They're kind of rare. But it's, it's obvious colonized people often express themselves in ways that weren't always easily understood by colonial powers and are still kind of misunderstood by people today.
um, but they're kind of interesting to see that it didn't all it wasn't always physical violence or uh, violent uprisings sometimes it was more creative ways of uh, resisting the imperial power um, so that's going to be it for this lesson let me know if you have any questions and i'll be sure to try to help you out